is really a continuation or a follow-up to my previous video titled RAW versus JPEG. If you're unfamiliar with terms like 8-bit or 14-bit or don't know the difference between a RAW and a JPEG image, I'd suggest you go to this video first, which is linked above, and then come back and watch this one. Uh, some of the things I discuss in this particular video, I've already discussed in detail in that video. This video is titled Shoot to Edit. And besides going over in the previous video the benefits of shooting JPEG out of camera, uh, RAW or RAW, RAW and JPEG, um, in that video I stated that I prefer to shoot RAW only. So this video really is geared up for those of you who shoot RAW only or who want to sort of go towards shooting RAW only. Now if you shoot JPEG or RAW plus JPEG, uh, the information will still be helpful to you, but that's what I'm focusing on. Bear in mind there's multiple ways in which you can shoot RAW. You know, it all depends on what you're doing. It all depends whether you already have a vision or at least a, an idea of what you want the final image to look like. You may be shooting for um, an editor or a company that's wanting to use the file multiple ways, not just one particular way. So you've got to give them as many options as possible. You may be shooting that you don't know what the final image is going to look like because you haven't really given it a lot of thought, but you want to get as much information onto that sensor as possible. So it gives you options when you go back and edit. Because if you do shoot with the vision in mind, you've got to be very careful that you don't limit your RAW in a way that if you changed your mind during the editing process, the information that you would have required to take the image a different direction may not be there anymore. So you may have heard of two types of exposure or two types of looks, high key and low key. High key, when you think of high key, you think of little regard for protecting your highlights or clipping or blowing out your highlights. So what you're doing is you're concentrating really on the shadow areas. You want to get as much information or detail in the shadows. You're wanting to sort of give it an overexposed look. You want to blow out highlights. I'm not talking about specular highlights or car lights coming towards you or reflections where you can't control those. I'm talking about general light, ambient light. The other one is low key. Uh, now low key images is the exact opposite to that. All care is going gone into protecting the highlights. You're exposing for the highlights. Um, so in camera, it looks as though you're exposed correctly for the highlights. So you, you've lost a lot of information in those shadow areas. And it kind of gives you that sort of very dramatic look um, that you see in quite a few images. Now, the more experience you have as a photographer, the easier it is for you to judge without having to use any particular tools, your exposure in camera. You're able to tell pretty quickly where you run the risk of clipping a highlight or blowing out your highlights or run the risk of losing detail in your shadows. And you can do that just by looking through your EVF, or if you use a viewfinder, um, you can use your LCD and sort of chimp and see kind of what you're getting without getting too technical. But there is a tool in the camera that's really geared up to help photographers be a little bit more accurate when it comes to when you particularly when you've got time, you know, you might be doing a shoot where you've got a lot more time on your hands. You can be a little bit more careful um, with the image that you produce, making sure you're getting as much detail on that sensor as possible um, across the board. And that's your histogram. Simply put, the histogram is a representation of the tonal values of the image. The right-hand side being the highlights and the left-hand side being the shadows and all the mid-tones in between. Obviously, once your information or the histogram goes beyond those edges, then you're clipping your highlights, blowing your highlights out, or you're losing detail in the shadows. Now, the heart of the histogram is showing you where all your pixels are in relation to those particular tonal values. So if you've got a high peak in a certain area, it's showing you in whatever particular tone, that's, that tone is, is covering the majority of your pixels on your sensor. The more contrast in the image, you'll see that the histogram tends to push out wider and troughs in the middle a bit more because it's got less mid-tones and it's got more highlights and shadows in the image. So, that's, so, so left to right is showing you tonal values and the height of it is showing you where majority of the pixels are on that particular tonal value. There are three histograms that photographers generally use, luminosity, RGB, and color histogram. Um, the two that get used in your camera and the vast majority of photographers use is RGB and color histogram. And the vast majority, including myself, would be using the RGB most of the time. Occasionally, it's very helpful to use a color histogram because sometimes you don't get accurate readings around each color uh, channel, red, green, and blue you may be photographing a red rose, for example, and the RGB histogram may not show the red in the rose is actually clipping in the highlights. Um, that's because it's taking the, the, cut, the actual color of the pixel, which is a, a makeup of the three channels, as opposed to looking at the independent channel. So if you had looked at the color histogram in that situation, you might have actually shown you that just the red channel was clipping 
and it might have avoided the issue to start with. But it's quite seldom that that, that would come into play. It's really in particular situations. But just bear in mind that you can use those two histograms. And when you actually play back the image, uh, particularly on the Fujifilm cameras, it actually shows you when you bring up the histogram, it shows you four histograms. It actually shows you the RGB at the top and it shows you three histograms below representing the three channels, red, green, and blue. Now, as useful as the histogram is, it's limited. When it comes to actually viewing your EVA for your LCD, that is a live video feed coming to those screens. And when you play back an image after you've taken it, that is a JPEG preview. So irrespective of whether you shot RAW and JPEG or RAW only, your camera still produces a JPEG preview. And that's the image that gets played back on your LCD when you want to view it. And that gets embedded into the RAW information. And it's this image and the live feed where the histogram gets its information from. That's how it builds up its tonal scale or its tonal view of the image you're about to take. Now we know, as discussed in the previous video, that's eight bits of information as opposed to the potential 14 bits that the camera offers you when you shoot a, J a raw file. So when you look at that histogram, it's actually shorter, if you want to call it that. It's showing you less tonal value than actually what you're able to capture with the 14 bits. So you might have pushed your information all the way to the ends of those histograms, to the highlights and the shadows. But what you don't know if you're shooting raw only is that you can actually predict that it could go a little bit further. So you, you have a safe area in which you're operating. If you go beyond that, you more than likely will still be able to retain that highlight in post-production or raise up that shadow in post-production and retain the detail. As mentioned before, irrespective of whether you shoot raw and JPEG or raw only, your camera's preview or JPEG that is produced is done so through the settings that you've set up in camera, like your film simulation, like your tone curve, like your dynamic range, all those settings that you've put in place that produce the image that comes to the back of your LCD screen affects your histogram. So if you've pushed your highlights on the tone curve and you've pushed your uh, shadows to darken them, creating a more contrasty JPEG, it affects the way your histogram reads the tonal values. So by doing that, even though you're not shooting JPEG, the histogram is exaggerated even further, meaning it's giving you even le less leeway when it comes to knowing where your highlights and your shadows can be pushed to. Because it's effectively the starting point is already have it, ha has it pretty much stretched across the whole histogram because you've increased contrast in the preview. This is why it's important when you're shooting RAW only that you shoot to edit. You don't shoot to create a great image on the back of your LCD or your EVF. It's not about playing back images for people so that they're very impressed. It's about creating the best possible file to take into post-production because that's what you're shooting for. You're not shooting to create great images in camera. You're shooting for post-production. So you really got to break the habit about being worried about what the image looks like on the LCD and more about what your histogram looks like or what, how much detail is actually captured. So how do we get the histogram to show us a better representation of 14 bits of information? Now, it's never going to give you that 14 bits, but we want to get it closer, at least expand what it currently gives us so that we have a little bit more leeway on the edges so we know how far we can push the image, giving us the most dynamic range we can to take it into post. Well, there's a couple of tricks. Now, over the years, certain manufacturers have allowed you to sort of um, save onto the camera like a profile white balance. It's called uni white balance. There's different methods that people use where almost it creates like a greenish muddy looking JPEG on the back of your camera. But because you've set the white balance in a certain way, you've even expanded that information on your histogram even further. I don't really want to go down that route. I don't use that. I think it's really the extreme edges. I, I don't think, you know, unless you're doing a really particular high end commercial type job where you've got to be super, super accurate with each image you take, I don't know if you will really want to be involved in that personally. I think um, there's simple techniques that you can use to expand that histogram and give you way better options when it comes to reading the histogram. Number one way is to first of all go into your JPEG settings. Even though you're not shooting JPEG, you want to go to film simulation, you want to go to your tone curve. Some of the cameras, the older models of the Fujifilm cameras, don't, sh don't show tone curve, they show highlights, shadows, and so on. And you want to minus those and set those as, as low as possible. So you want to go like minus two of the highlights, minus two of the shadows. You can either use Provia, or you can use like Pro Neg Standard, which are very neutral, contrast-free uh, simulations. You want the image to be as contrastless as possible, uh, have the least contrast. Um, just 
giving you as much dynamic range as possible. And by doing that, you're expanding that histogram and you, you can actually see it. So if you set up a shot, you look at the histogram and you set up a very neutral uh, profile with these adjustments, you'll see how everything on the histogram kind of pulls into the middle more, giving you a little bit more space in the sides. That's one way of doing it. And it's a very good way of doing it. And I would suggest you actually do both and I'll explain why. But the second way, uh, Fujifilm, uh, I know I don't know about other camera manufacturers if you use a different system, but one of the things you can do is set up natural live view. All right, so what natural live view does is it actually um, removes all that, that information around that JPEG preview. It removes simulation, it removes um, your tone curve, your highlights, your shadows, your white balance, it takes it all off and it gives you a very bland, natural view through your viewfinder. And what that does, it actually even expands the histogram a bit further than actually going making those adjustments on your JPEG preview. It gives you a little bit more. So I would say number one would be natural live view. And what I would do is I would set it up as a, a function button that you can just push and turn it off and on. And do it in a function button that you're not going to easily hit. It has to be a deliberate action because if you do hit it, it might mess things up if you're trying to shoot raw and JPEG. And I certainly wouldn't use natural live view if you're shooting JPEG in any way that you want to hand over a JPEG in this process. This is for raw shooting only. Now, along with natural live view, there's one other very, very important um, function button to set up or at least feature to use. It's preview exposure in manual mode off and on. There's an option for that. Now, you've got to keep your preview exposure on. Because if that is off and you're going to natural live view, you're not going to be able to see changes in your exposure through your EVF. So you're not going to be able to get your exposure right. If, you, if you're used to actually depending on your EVF to show you exposure, make sure that is on. Now, obviously, if you're doing flash photography and different things, that's where you turn it off. But keep your preview exposure on and keep your natural live view on. That way you're getting a live exposure preview feedback, but it's not affecting your histogram. It's giving you the broadest possible histogram that you have. So you really know where your edges are, or at least closer to what it would be. I still think you can go a little bit further, but I wouldn't push it because you don't know for sure. Try and keep it in there. A lot of people say, how come my histogram in my camera doesn't look anything like my histogram does when it goes into Lightroom or one of the processing software? And it has a lot to do with your JPEG setup, the way your um, JPEG preview is set up and the way then Lightroom reads that file when it comes in and generates its own preview. Now, there's a reason why I said you should set up your JPEGs um, with those certain settings as well as using the natural live view is because in certain situations, you can't actually view um, the actual histogram accurately and you have to view it in playback. Meaning, if you're using off-camera flash, for example, all right, the flash hasn't fired yet, so you don't know what the histogram reading is on the completed image. You only can tell what the ambient light is doing. So it's very handy. You're setting up the shot. You've used your histogram to make sure that your background, you've controlled your highlights and shadows across the scene as much as possible if that's the look you're looking to go for. You know, a lot of these off-camera flashes are pretty low-key, some of them, and that'll be a different sort of setup. But you're trying to get as much information for your background or your ambience then you bring a subject in and light them with the flash. Now, your histogram is not going to give you a reading on that flash because it hasn't fired yet. So the only way you're going to know is that you hit the playback button. And when you hit the playback button, just hit the display button on the camera a couple of times. And the sRGB uh, histogram, or all, all four I think it is, will come up on your playback. And it'll actually show you the histogram, including the flash that's fired. Um, and that's pretty handy. Now, remember... If you hadn't have set up your JPEG properly, your histogram might be a little bit sort of compressed because of the way JPEGs are set up. That's why I said it's important to set up live, natural live view on your camera, as well as reducing things like highlights and shadows on your JPEG preview and the right simulations and so on. So at least on the JPEG pre uh, preview playback, your histogram is not too compressed. There's another tool that other people use, and that's the highlight alerts, where it actually shows you like a black area where you've blown out the highlights. Now, that's also a reading off your histogram as well. So it's working out on the histogram where you've clipped a highlight, and then it shows you where the highlight is clipped. Now, personally, I don't like zebras, and as a photographer, maybe videography would be different. Black things flashing at me and things, I don't want to see that when I'm taking an image. I don't want all that digital overlay and too much information. I'm trying to 
focus on the, the actual composition and the image I want, and I just rely on the histogram. But when you play back the image, um, the actual histogram that gets presented on the playback, like I mentioned earlier, will also show you the highlight alert as well, and that will automatically kick in. So you'll see in parts of the image where the highlight will flash black, so you know that you've pushed it too far. Now, remember, again, that's a JPEG preview that is reading it off, so you probably have a little leeway. So if you've got little black spots that are appearing, um, my guess is that if you take it into post-production, you're safe. Now, don't take my word for it because I don't know the situation you're shooting in and I don't know how you've set up your JPEGs. But more than likely, you have a little bit of leeway. So a couple of black dots that are flashing at you on the playback, especially if you're doing like off-camera flash and stuff like that and where the flashes hit the person, you might have a couple of little areas. More than likely, you can retain those. This is an example of where a histogram was really helpful to me. I was in Havana in Cuba and I was moving from one point in the city to the other. So I hopped onto a tourist bus which is an open top, and I was at the top. And I was just driving along. I got my camera ready in aperture priority, kind of set it at about, I think it was around 5.6 f4, somewhere around there, just looking for things to photograph. It's not really a great vantage point all the time to shoot down off those buses. But as we were moving through the intersections, I suddenly saw one road. We were moving quite slowly through it, but it was great. It was a long street. It had um, a pink Cadillac up the front. It had a couple of the taxis, lots of people. But it had these heavy pockets of light coming across the streets uh, throughout the scene. And... All I had to do was just quickly, instead of trying to judge it while shooting, I just quickly saw the histogram in my viewfinder and I knew that everything, I, I just, I think I used exposure compensation by one stop or whatever. I was able to put everything into the middle of the histogram and I took the shot knowing that when I took it into post-production, I had details in the highlights all the way through the shadows. So this image contains um, detail all the way through the tonal values. So I just did a quick drive out today to do some images for this particular video. Pretty simple. I could see conditions were quite contrasty because you had clouds in the sky building for the front that's now come in. Uh, the sun was behind the clouds. It was really creating a lot of those sort of highlight, bright highlight areas in the scene, shooting straight into the sun with the sun behind the clouds. So I knew that would be sort of perfect to really get that histogram nice and stretched. Obviously, it all depends. You know, you can zoom in on a part of that image and there's less highlights and shadows within that there's more midtones and you'll see your histogram kind of push up in the middle but a lot of those wide shots where i was in, in, incorporating the sky and the clouds especially the edges of the clouds where the sun's beaming through you know my histogram really pushed out to the edges so it was a good demonstration as to what it looks like in camera so i did a couple of variations in these shots uh, nothing major pretty simple setup i used the 35 mil i used the 56 mil i used the 200 mil I also did some photo stitching where I did some raw images and sequence. I brought them into post-production, did a photo stitch. What's really cool now is that, you know, with the modern, with our modern sort of editing suites, you know, when it stitches it, it still keeps it as a raw image. The final image that it produces is a DNG file, as opposed to creating JPEGs, then stitching it. So it's really nice. You don't have to edit the images first before stitching. It produces a DNG for you. So this is where the histogram is really, really helpful. So what I do in these situations is I use my histogram with live view on and things like that, which I've already discussed. And I look at the start and I go through, without taking the photograph, I just go through the scene with the camera and watch the histogram. And in that way, I know from left to right, because the right-hand side of the uh, image was darker and out to see on the left-hand side, it was brighter. So yeah, so all I did was I used the histogram, went through it all and I made sure at no point did the highlights blow out. So I knew. So when I did the photo stitch with a, a manual exposure, I said manual focus, I just set a point in focus and I just went through it. I knew that when I turned it into a panoramic image in Lightroom and it created its raw image, I had the as much tonal value there as possible across that new image that I could then edit uh, in post-production, which is really, really cool. So now that we've set up the histogram, how do you use the histogram? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Outside of those type of images, which I mentioned earlier, like low key and high key, where you deliberately... Uh, losing information, blowing your highlights or, or losing information in your shadows. But rather, with the intention of getting as much dynamic range as possible, you would use what's called exposure to the right or exposed to the right, which is ETTR. And it's pretty simple. What you're effectively doing is that you are trying to get your highlights, the right-hand side of your histogram, as close to the right as possible before leaving the histogram or, ex or clipping the highlights. Preference has been put on protecting your highlights. That's number one. And you'll see that with most images. I think, I don't want to generalize, but I think most images look better where a highlight is protected more than a shadow is. You know, having dark shadows with no detail, 
is not as detrimental to an image, in my opinion, than an, in like an obvious situation where you know that the photographer should have really done a better job of protecting their highlights. So ETTR is a very effective way of guaranteeing that the most important thing, your highlights, are intact and not blown or clipped. So whether you use manual exposure or you use uh, exposure compensation with a priority mode, doesn't really matter. You're basically just raising your exposure to the point where your highlights don't exit out the right hand side of the histogram, guaranteeing that your highlights aren't clipped, but you've retained as much shadow detail as possible. Now, obviously, if you're dealing with a very uh, well, with a scene that's not really contrasty, um, that sort of has a lot of midtones, well, everything will be pushed into the middle of the histogram. And really, what you've got to do there, you just got to make sure everything sits in the middle, and nothing goes to the outsides. And you're pretty much safe. I mean, it's a pretty simple way of shooting. You know that with an image like that, really you can do what you want in post-production. You can increase the contrast. You can you know, add to the image quite a lot. But if you're dealing with a high contrast situation, like I was today out at, the, you know, at the, the rocky area there by the beach, you know, my priority was get the highlights as close to the right-hand side of the histogram as possible and retain as much detail in the shadows as, as possible. And fortunately for me, um, you know, using those methods that I mentioned earlier, I had everything on that uh, histogram. I didn't lose anything on the highlights or the shadows. So it's an image that has the, the most possible dynamic range I could get out of the particular camera I was using, which was the X-Pro3. So you've got to customize the way you set up your camera. Now you have different options when it comes to the LCD and the EVF. You can actually choose the information which is displayed. Try and choose as little as possible and really only focus on those important elements. But I've always got my histogram on, irrespective of whether I use the histogram or not. A lot of the time I don't use it, but when you do use it, it's invalu invaluable. Um, and also remember at the playback, if you hit the display button a couple of times, the histogram will actually uh, present itself on your playback image as well, which is really handy. What's really cool about the GFX100 is their sub-monitor allows you to actually display besides a histogram, but it does allow you to display a histogram on the back, which I find very, very helpful. So if you're doing landscape work or you're on a tripod, you're not using the EVF, you've got it constantly displayed at the back here, and you always know your highlights and your shadows are intact just by reading the back sub-monitor, which is really, really cool. So on the GFX, I've set up function buttons for natural uh, live view, which is on and off here. So it's a little chance of it hitting it there. And the button to the right is the preview exposure, which you turn on and off, whether I use flash or not, or natural light shooting or ambient light shooting. So it's pretty easy to operate those two. So on the GFX, here you can see the histogram has been represented on the sub monitor. And when I turn on natural live view, you'll see how all the information, the tonal values tend to push closer to the middle, giving you more space on the outsides, which will then closely represent what a 14 bit um, histogram would show you. Not exactly the same, but are definitely better than what the 8-bit was showing you. So on the X-Pro3, again, I have the histogram um, displaying all the time on my EVF and LCD. And then the exposure lock and the focus lock button, which I never use, I've turned that into the natural live view button. And then the top function button here, I've turned into the ex uh, preview exposure button, which I use quite a lot because I do do off-camera flash, not just ambient light work as well. So it's pretty easy to set it up. And that way you get the most information out of your um, histogram. So I was in a good mood today uh, after the shoot. Um, it wasn't a very complex shoot, but I thought I'd share with you the panoramic image that I put together from that shoot. So you're welcome to download that and use that image. Please only use it for private use, not commercial use, but you can print it if you want to, or you can just ignore the image. So yeah, hopefully uh, someone can get something out of that. Or if you know someone who'd like an image like that, you're welcome to use it. For those of you who are interested, not only is the RAW versus JPEG video I did uh, very closely linked to this one. Also go check out my camera exposure part one and part two video where I show you how I actually shoot in different scenarios using full manual and priority mode. I use all the different modes. I use everything on my camera for different setups. So you're welcome to check that out as well. If this video was a benefit to you, please do like it. it makes a big difference. Also go check out my other videos on my channel. Lots of previews and tutorials and please subscribe. Thanks so much everyone and God bless. Oh, <laughs>